We don't know whether there is life of any kind beyond Earth. But I think that the 21st century is the century in which we're going to answer that question. My name is Jill Tarter. I'm the Director Emeritus of SETI Research at the SETI Institute. We're here to talk about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or actually, the search for extraterrestrial technology. We've been at this SETI business since 1960, and you might think that we must have searched everything, but in fact, we've searched almost nothing. The total volume that we need to explore, set that equal to the volume of all the Earth's oceans. Well, since 1960, we've actually searched maybe a hot tub's worth of the oceans. Really not very much. It's such a huge universe out there, and we've observed such a small part of it. Do I believe in aliens? It's not the right question. We're talking about a scientific exploration. Whatever anyone believes has no relevance. We want to know what is. Odds are reasonable that the chemistry and physics that provided biology on this planet may have done so elsewhere. We have always asked, are we alone? We've wanted to know who's over the next hill, what's out there. I think we should try and answer it. If they help us answer it because they come here, okay. Just this morning, jet fighters raced aloft over Wright-Patterson Air Force Base at Dayton, Ohio to intercept a reported saucer. Returning pilots swore that it was a light that could not have been a reflection and that it evaded them at a very high rate of speed. Unidentified flying objects, they're there. I've seen one. They're not necessarily related to alien spacecraft. There's just no evidence that holds up that says that things that are seen on camera, for example, on the Navy radars, have anything to do with extraterrestrial spacecraft. Well, if there's a like thing, I can't explain claims of alien spacecraft seen by radar. I can say that that's new technology. It isn't necessarily very stable yet. The most often reported UFO is the planet Venus. People, when they look at a dark sky, don't really understand what they're seeing. They're conflating perhaps their desires to see an extraterrestrial spacecraft with whatever is actually happening there. Until about 25 years ago, high altitude military airplanes saw these bright lights above thunderclouds that were totally unexplained. We didn't understand until we got satellites with high time resolution cameras looking down at the Earth that lightning travels up as well as down. And now we have a whole new physics of sprites and elves above thunderclouds. So that was a bit of new physics that was observed, not understood, sometimes conflated with alien spacecraft. And I'm sure that a lot of that is happening today. Whether or not an extraterrestrial visitor is benevolent or potentially a threat is something of which various people have various opinions. Stephen Hawking is known for saying, you know, when Columbus showed up in the New World, it didn't work out really well for the natives. But I think that's, that's the wrong analogy. The ability to travel interstellar distances and actually show up on our doorstep is amazing. A huge technological gap that we can't breach at this point. So I think anything that they could need or want, they can manufacture in their own home system. Also, to have become that advanced technologically, I think they have to be a lot older than we are. And I think they've had to outgrow the violent and competitive characteristic that probably was part of their infancy. I don't have any reason to worry about an older technology that manages to come here. 
I think what they're interested in is curiosity. It's about us. We don't know what they might look like. They're going to look like the planet they evolved on. We have evolved on a planet that is illuminated by a sun, so we have eyes that perceive light. Had we evolved on a planet that circled a small red dwarf star, we might have different sensors. Our eyes might not see visible. They might sense heat and infrared. Had we evolved on a planet that had more gravity because it was bigger than the Earth, we might be flatter. Had we evolved on a planet that was mostly ocean, we might have gills. It doesn't matter to me what they look like. And I think nature is probably a lot more imaginative than I am. The difference between life and intelligence actually is getting more difficult to discern. We used to have this very, very privileged opinion that we were intelligent and the rest of the planet was just alive. We're beginning to understand the, the breadth of intelligence across a huge line of species. Extremophiles are forms of life that live in conditions that we humans, for example, couldn't tolerate. In the bottom of the ocean where the magma is boiling up, they live actually in channels within ice, frozen in ice. It is the ability of life to live in environments which would be lethal instantly to humans that encourages us to think that there's more habitable real estate out there than we might have thought. When we started the SETI quest, we didn't know whether there were planets around other stars. Now we know, thanks to ground-based telescopes and the Kepler spacecraft, that there are more planets than stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Every star has at least one planet, statistically. That was something we didn't know until just a couple of years ago. The discovery of exoplanets everywhere, the discovery of extremophiles on Earth, it has made this whole search for intelligent technological life elsewhere seem much more reasonable and realistic. What we say we're doing is looking for extraterrestrial intelligence, but in fact, we've decided to use technology as a proxy for intelligence. We look for some kinds of signals that are generated that nature can't manufacture. We look for large astro-engineering kinds of structures. And we assume, if we found the technology, that there is some intelligent technologist who created it. Technosignatures can be something that it leaks or is the result of engineering done for their own purposes, or technosignatures can be deliberate attempts to make something that's detectable over interstellar distances. Astrobiologists tend to be interested in finding biosignatures, things that they can look for within our solar system, on Mars, on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, that would indicate biology, biosignatures. If you're talking about the moon, or Mars, or other planets in our solar system, or beyond the solar system, no. To date, we have no evidence of life. If we find life, we need to ask the question, about whether that life is related to us. Whether an early rock from Earth got chipped off and seeded Mars, or vice versa. Early in the solar system, the formation of the solar system, it was very violent, and rocks were exchanged between Venus, Earth, Mars, and the idea that one of those rocks might have contained some kind of life that was 
in a condition, a spore, that could survive the transference from one body to another within the solar system. That's panspermia. In physics, we count one, two, infinity. If we have one example, it could be singular. The moment you find a second example, then you know it's universal. So if we find a second genesis of life in our solar system, independently evolved, a new evolution of life, we will know that life is everywhere out there. We're listening. We're trying to say, is there anyone out there whose technology we can detect? SETI started observationally in 1960 to listen for radio signals that were confined to a single channel on the radio dial. We have evolved from there. Much broader receivers, bigger radio dials, many, many more channels, and we're listening for different kinds of patterns in frequency and time. In the future, we'll bring in artificial intelligence and neural networks to look for different kinds of patterns that aren't natural. We are listening. We are actually not transmitting deliberately at the moment. So there's a controversy in the SETI community about whether we should just listen or whether, in fact, it's necessary for us to deliberately transmit. I have a problem with the transmitting bit. We sometimes manage two-year plans or five-year plans, but we just can't manage 10,000-year plans. And I think if you're going to transmit, you have to do so with a determination that you're going to do it for a long time. It's something you've got to commit to. And I don't think we're grown up enough yet as a civilization to do that. But when and if we do become a long-lived, stable technological civilization, then I think transmission, continuous transmission, in all directions or to a very large number of targets that are potentially habitable hosts for other civilizations. That becomes a plan that we take on in the future when we can commit to long-term planning. We're too young now. We should listen first, see what's out there. We've got lots and lots of problems on this planet. Why should we be spending any money at all on trying to find out whether there are other creatures out there? And the answer is because looking for life, an intelligent life beyond this planet, has the effect of holding up a mirror. And that mirror shows all of us on this planet, shows us all as the same. When compared to something else out there, we are all the same. And I think that this is incredibly important for our long-term future. Because the challenges on this planet that we face do not recognize national boundaries. They are challenges that are going to have to be worked on globally in a cooperative fashion. And so the more that we see ourselves not as individuals, not as Americans, not as Europeans, not as Chinese. The more that we see ourselves as earthlings, as humans, the more likely we are to be able to find a way to manage these global challenges. So I think SETI, even if we never detect evidence of someone else, I think thinking about it, talking to people about it, getting the world to encompass that sort of cosmic perspective is something that will help us manage to get to a long future.